Hello, hello, and welcome or welcome back to my channel. So today we are going to be talking about a highly requested album for Errors Analyzed, and that is Britney Spears' Blackout. I grew up with this album and kind of, you know, never stopped listening to it since it came out, but it was definitely fun and sort of different to look back on this album and the entire era from an adult lens. I think aside from the music, the Blackout era is just a reminder of how vicious the media was in the 2000s. Like sure, it's not perfect now, but it, it was something else back in the 2000s. And I do want to give my usual Eras Analyze disclaimer that these Eras Analyze videos aren't an album review, but instead a retrospective of the entire era. But before we get into Blackout, we do need to take a word from the sponsor of today's video, MD Hair. So for the past few months now, I've been on a journey to sort of protect and heal my hair because I've noticed it's not as healthy or as full as it used to be, which is mostly my fault because of things like overstyling or using too much heat. But as you guys know, MD Hair has been helping me out. MD Hair's customizable hair care system is formulated by dermatologists and will have you well on your way to having fuller and thicker hair. With MD Hair, you'll start out with a quiz about your hair goals and your hair issues. They'll ask you several questions to get to the root of the problem, such as your hair texture, stress levels, and diet, all of which do affect how you should be caring for your hair. Based on your results, MD Hair will formulate a kit tailored to your needs. Each kit contains a shampoo, conditioner, hair serum, hair supplements, and collagen. And your MD Hair subscription comes with 24-7 chat support with registered nurses and dermatologists. One of my favorite MD Hair products is actually the Customized Hair Care Serum because it's just a lifesaver whenever my hair is braided up because this dropper is absolutely perfect for just sort of, you know, getting in the parts when my hair is braided and making sure my scalp remains moisturized throughout. In just as little as six weeks, you'll notice reduced shedding, which means that you are well on your way to having thicker and healthier hair. So go ahead and customize your hair regrowth treatment with MD Hair, and when you do, you can use my code CANNIBAL70 for 70% 70 off of your first month of customized products. It is a limited time offer, so you definitely don't want to miss out. Huge, huge thanks to MD Hair for sponsoring today's video and supporting the channel, and now let's get into talking about Blackout. Blackout is Britney's fifth studio album. It was released in 2007 and was her first since her 2003 album, In The Zone. To contextualize Blackout, it's important to discuss what was happening with Britney leading up to the album's release, and there is a lot to cover, so do bear with me. Britney announced she began working on her next album while touring for In The Zone. Some of Britney's writers and producers have since confirmed working on music with her or that she reached out to them with ideas for songs. The new album was tentatively called Original Doll. Britney initially said Original Doll would come out around the summer of 2005 or possibly sooner. She expressed a lot of excitement for this upcoming era, stating she wanted working on the project to be so fun that people couldn't tell if she was at work or at play. The only confirmed song from Original Doll was Mona Lisa, which Britney recorded in Germany with her producer's Bloodshine Avant. In December of 2004, she made a surprise appearance on Kiss FM, where she unveiled the Mona Lisa demo. Britney said Mona Lisa was the name of her alter ego she tapped into to get things done and dedicated the song to all the legends and icons out there. A rep from Britney's label said while she was in the studio, there was no album scheduled for release. The rep also stated there were no plans for Mona Lisa to hit radios. Original Doll was scrapped for unknown reasons and the majority of thoughts as to what the project would have been like are merely speculation. Britney announced instead of an album, she would be focusing on her upcoming show. This show, of course, was Britney and Kevin Chaotic, her reality show with her then-husband Kevin Federline. Mona Lisa's studio version was included on the soundtrack. Britney and Kevin is somewhat of rural and romance, getting engaged in July of 2004 after three months of dating. They were married that September, and Britney later announced she wanted to take some time off to start a family. Britney's relationship with Kevin resulted in media criticism for them both. Kevin had gotten with Britney while his ex, Char Jackson, was pregnant with the second child. In addition, because Britney was significantly more famous than Kevin, who was a backup dancer and very minor actor, he was called a gold digger. Both the marriage and the reality television show were considered poor career moves for Britney. Reviews for Britney and Kevin Chaotic were terrible, with many claiming the show portrays Britney in a bad light. The series was initially meant to document her time touring for In The Zone, known as the Onyx Hotel Tour. Britney was unable to finish the tour due to a knee injury that required surgery. The series was then reworked to document Britney's relationship with Kevin and their eventual marriage. Britney said about the series, 
From the day that Kevin and I met, there have been constant rumors and inaccurate speculation about our lives together. I feel that last year the tabloids ran my life and I am really excited about showing my fans what really happened rather than all the stories which have been misconstrued by the journalists in the past. As I mentioned before, I am now going to be expressing my personal life through art. She since said that she regrets the show and would never do anything like it again. In April of 2005, Brittany announced her pregnancy with her first son, Sean Preston, who was born that September. At the time, Brittany was 23 years old. Though she wanted time off to enjoy her family, becoming a new mom only made the public even more interested in her. Brittany had always been hounded by the paparazzi, but it would become worse in the following months and years. Brittany's public image took another hit in early 2006 when she was seen driving with five-month-old Sean in her lap. While leaving a coffee shop, Brittany claimed she was sworn by the paparazzi. In her haste to get away, she didn't take the time to strap Sean into his car seat and instead put him on her lap and drove off. The incident resulted in the L.A. County Sheriff visiting Brittany's home. After the backlash, Brittany publicly apologized and called her actions a mistake. She said in a statement, I was terrified that this time the physically aggressive paparazzi would put both me and my baby in danger. I instinctively took measures to get my baby and me out of harm's way, but the paparazzi continued to stalk us. I love my child and would do anything to protect him. The agency that took the pictures, however, claimed they were the only two photographers there and they were ones that Brittany was familiar with. They said that they never harassed or disturbed Brittany in order to get the photos. It's more than valid to criticize her for not putting her baby in a car seat, but a lot of people took the situation as another excuse to poke fun at Brittany rather than being genuinely concerned for Sean's safety. But um, my safety and um, my privacy and respect are three things that I feel like are trying to be taken away from me right now. As a mother, I have to speak and I have to say something. I think 90% of the world would agree that the tabloids have kind of gone a little far with me lately and I think it's time, you know, I do need to speak up a little bit. In September of 2006, almost exactly a year after Sean's birth, Brittany welcomed her second son, Jaden James. Two months later, she filed for divorce from Kevin, citing irreconcilable differences. Apparently, in response, K-Fed wrote, Today, I'm a free man, fuck a wife, give me my kids, bitch, on a bathroom wall in a nightclub. Brittany later said in her 2008 documentary that she married Kevin more for the idea of it rather than it actually making her happy. Soon after her divorce, she was frequently spotted out and about partying, typically with the likes of notorious party girls like Lindsay Lohan and Paris Hilton. The tabloids published pictures of Brittany daily attacking her looks, behavior, not being home with her children, and at times all three. She was often photographed questionably dressed or underdressed and often without underwear. 2007 was the year when it all came crashing down for Britney, both personally and in terms of her public image. In January, she said on her website, I look forward to coming back this year bigger and better than ever and to reaching out to my fans on a more personal level. Yet just the following month, things took another turn for the worst. On February 16th, Britney walked into Esther's hair salon. She claimed her hair extensions were too tight and she wanted her head shaved because of this. Esther Tugnazi, the salon's owner, said she refused to shave Britney's head and encouraged her to consider it some more. Esther claims that the moment she turned to talk to Britney's bodyguard, Britney took the clippers and buzzed off her own hair. This was done in front of paparazzi and fans and others who watched through the salon windows. Britney was calm and expressionless the entire time she shaved her head. Tugnazi said, The only emotions that she showed was when she said her mom was going to be mad that she was doing this to her hair and she got a little bit teary-eyed. Then she all of a sudden realized what she did. There were rumors that some of Britney's hair was going up for $1 million on eBay, but the hair couldn't be authenticated. After shaving her head, Britney went to a tattoo shop where she got two tattoos. There she claimed she shaved her head because she was tired of everyone touching her. Other sources say Britney specified and said she was tired of people touching her hair. Again, this incident led to Britney being attacked mercilessly by the media. Several outlets, comedians, and articles referred to her as crazy, but it seemed that very little of the concern was genuine. Yes, it was acknowledged that she was clearly struggling, but the situation was mostly viewed as entertainment. Days after the head shaving incident, Brittany checked into Promises, a Malibu rehab center. She checked out less than 24 hours later. This was her second time doing so that week. The day after checking in and out of Promises, Brittany was followed by the paparazzi after leaving Kevin Federline's home. This resulted in her attacking one of their cars with an umbrella and being photographed doing so. Months later, Brittany posted an apology to her website. She said she was preparing for a movie role, and she takes her role seriously and got carried away. Amidst all this, K-Fed requested an emergency custody hearing. 
As of a temporary order from February 1st, they had joint custody, but the emergency hearing was held just three weeks later. After about a month in March, Brittany had completed a program at Promises. The news was announced by her manager, Larry Rudolph, who Brittany fired a month later. She had fired him before, back in 2004. In May, Brittany posted to her website confirming her rehab stint. She called the experience humbling and said it wasn't caused by drugs or alcohol, but the fallout from her divorce from Kevin. She said shaving her head was also a result of this and her way of both rebelling and shedding the past relationship. In July, Brittany was embroiled in controversy again after a photo shoot with OK Magazine. Brittany had agreed to do a tell-on spread for the magazine, for which she would be paid $1 million. The interview was intended to help restore Brittany's image, which was especially important as her upcoming album had been announced. When she arrived on set, Brittany was dissatisfied with the wardrobe choices. This was after communicating she would bring her own clothes to the shoot and then changing her mind. According to an editor for OK, when Brittany was told not to wear a silk dress during lunch, she did so anyway and ruined the borrowed dress by wiping her grease-stained hands on it. London, her new dog, pooped on a Zach Posen dress that cost nearly $7,000. Brittany left the shoot early, taking thousands of dollars worth of clothing without permission. Instead of the unfinished interview, OK published an article about Britney's erotic behavior on set, which of course did the opposite of her goal of repairing her image. The conclusion of their article stated, At OK, we'd love to have our old Britney back. What we experienced was a young girl who was desperately in need of help, and sadly she surrounded herself with too many people who are pretending that nothing is wrong. Britney's divorce from Kevin was finalized just days after the OK story broke. In their settlement, Kevin received $1 million and $20,000 a month in child support. It was reported that Kevin had been reluctant to sign the agreement because he was still concerned about Britney's behavior. Less than two weeks later, he sued for primary custody of Sean and Jaden. Two days prior, Britney had hit a parked car and fled the scene, apparently because she didn't have a valid California license. On August 31st, Britney Spears released the first single from her upcoming album, Gimme More. This is the song that has the now iconic It's Britney Bitch opening, a daring statement to announce her return to the airwaves. The line was actually unplanned and came from a joke from her producer, Danjo, while recording. Gimme More has dance pop, EDM, and electropop influences and is one of Danjo's earliest solo productions. He said the album was a chance for him to prove his talent outside of being associated with Timbaland. Danjo later stated, I didn't think about pop music while creating Blackout. I was into dance music and EDM at the time, but it wasn't mainstream yet. I was just going to a club in Miami a couple times to see the atmosphere. Everyone was bouncing around to Benny Benassi's satisfaction and Tiesto, literally in a trance. I was like, that's it. If my music doesn't make you feel like that, what are we doing? I didn't think about anything other than bringing that essence to popular culture. Gimme More is dark and sexy and definitely reminiscent of a packed nightclub. Britney recorded Gimme More while pregnant and finished after giving birth to Jaden. Carrie Hilson, who helped write the song, said about Britney, she gave 150%. I don't know any mother that would do that. Gimme More was met with rave reviews from bloggers, fans, and critics alike. A New York DJ said people were requesting the song all day. Some, of course, out of morbid curiosity, but most requests were genuine. Gimme More debuted at number 85 on the Hot 100, eventually peaking at number 3 after the album's release. It was Britney's first top 10 single since Toxic peaked at number 9 back in 2004. The video for Gimme More depicted Britney Spears at a nightclub, enticed by a brunette pole dancing version of herself. Reviews were mostly negative, criticizing the concept, Britney's dancing, and the fact that her body appeared digitally enhanced. Others pointed out the choppy editing, poor camera work, and video quality. Britney chose director Jake Safferty to direct the video, and the concept was her own idea. However, the makeup artist from the shoot claimed Britney sabotaged the director and refused to perform or follow the script. This implied the video initially had an actual plot line, which apparently was never completed during filming. During the shoot, photos leaked of Britney wearing outfits that never made it into the final cut. In 2011, additional scenes leaked, showing Britney strutting on a sidewalk in a black outfit and lying on zebra pillows holding a cat. One of the photographers on set said that Britney seemed cool, though she also seemed like a victim but resigned to it. The photographer also said he felt bad Britney had to shoot a video instead of taking time to rest and get her life in order. To fully cement her comeback, Britney was set to open the 2007 VMAs. If she could capitalize on Gimme More's hype with a strong performance, it could potentially quiet the detractors saying her best days were behind her. Months ago, Britney started soft launching her comeback by doing smaller performances in nightclubs. But the VMAs performance was meant to be an announcement that Britney was officially back. There was also speculation the network brought back the former VMA darling to increase falling ratings as people would surely tune into the performance. 
On September 9th, Britney opened the VMA singing a few lines from an Elvis song and then transitioning into Gimme More. The performance was nothing short of a disaster. During the performance, she looked dazed and distracted and only halfway executed the singing choreography. She stumbled during some parts, leaving some to question whether she was under the influence. Britney was raked over the coals not only for the performance, but also for her body. She was shamed mercilessly despite having two children back to back, the youngest not even a year old. Not that there's ever a reason to body shame people. Backstage, Britney cried uncontrollably after the performance because she knew she'd messed up. Prior to the show, she was extremely nervous. Britney had skipped several rehearsals and was out partying the night before the performance. Before the VMA, she'd only rehearsed two or three times. When Britney was crying backstage, it was reported she said she looked like a fat pig, having seen herself on the monitors in the auditorium. Right after Britney's performance, Sarah Silverman roasted her on stage. 25 years old and she's already accomplished everything she's going to accomplish in her life. It's weird to think that just a few years ago on this very show, she was this like sweet, innocent little girl in slutty clothes riding around with a python. Have you seen Britney's kids? Oh my God, they are the most adorable mistakes you will ever see. In response to a clip resurfacing in 2021, she tweeted, I was known then for roast. MTV asked me to mini roast Britney after her big performance. While she was performing, I was having diarrhea and going over my jokes. Had no idea she didn't kill. Unfortunate. Art changes over the years as we know more and the world changes. The fallout from Britney's VMA performance inspired one of the internet's earliest viral videos. Kara Cunningham, then known as Chris Crocker, uploaded a video detailing the hardships Britney had faced over the past years and tearfully pled for people to stop attacking her. Do we really want to see a 25-year-old woman leave behind two children and die? Have we learned nothing from Anna Nicole Smith? I know it's hard to see Britney Spears as a human being, but trust me, she is. She's a person. She's like you or I. And I don't know about you, but I know that I would be pretty shaken up right now. Ironically, Cunningham was also mocked for posting the video and was the butt of several jokes from the media and the press. The existence of the video and reactions to it have been used several times to exemplify just how different attitudes were around mental health and the treatment of celebrities back in 2007. After her VMA's performance, Britney's management team dropped her. She'd only been signed with them for a month. A couple weeks later, on the 1st of October, she lost custody of her sons. Her new album's title, Blackout, was announced just days later. Jive Records said the title was a reference to blocking out negativity and embracing life fully. Many were of the opinion that Britney should and almost had to address the events of the past couple years in her music. Music editor John Caramancia spoke on this saying, I think the best thing she could do is make an album that engages with the subject matter in some way. Not only to have a good album, but to have an album that's a declaration of mental health. Blackout's release date was planned for November 13th, but her label announced the album would be released in October due to leaks. Press Hilton was actually sued for allegedly leaking some songs from Blackout on his blog, but fans who listened to the leaks did express excitement for the album. Blackout was officially released on October 25th, 2007. It's the only one of Britney's albums she executive produced. With Blackout, the goal was to reinvent radio pop in a similar way that Nelly Furtado did with Promiscuous. The album is characterized by a lot of electropop, dance pop, and EDM, perfect for an album containing themes of nightlife, fame, and sex. Blackout has a dark and eerie atmosphere, one that feels both escapist and also trance-like. Other than Danger, some of Blackout's producers included Bloodshine Avon and The Neptunes. Overall, the production on the album was top tier. As one music critic put it, even though Britney wasn't at her best, she made sure to employ the best. Though it's easy to tell which songs were produced by Danger or by Bloodshine Avant, it doesn't hurt the album's cohesion. A lot of the Danger produced tracks are drum heavy and boast thumping bass lines, while most of the Bloodshine tracks are more sleek and electronic. Still, the common thread through each song is how club perfect and dance ready they are. Several songs on Blackout have an almost haunting touch to them, great examples being tracks like Freak Show and Get Back. The production is both cutting edge and retro at the same time, emphasized by a few of the tracks like Everybody and Heaven on Earth, which are modernizations of previous hits. Everybody was actually initially intended for Rihanna and the Cheetah Girls recorded the demo. Blackout debuted at number two in the Hot 100, selling 290,000 copies in its first week. The album was expected to go number one and seems like it only didn't due to a change in Billboard's rules. 
Prior albums only sold at one retailer weren't eligible for the charts. But due to a change in the rules, the Eagles long rode out of Eden took the number one spot despite being sold exclusively at Walmart. Though Blackout was Britney's first album to not debut at number one, it sold better than her previous album In The Zone. Several critics reviewed the album positively. Blackout was listed as one of the best of the year by publications including Billboard, Idolator, and Rolling Stone. Often, articles mentioning Blackout's positive reviews called them begrudging, as if critics were ready for the album to give them an excuse to pile on Britney. In their review, Pitchfork stated Blackout was superb modern pop, which could probably only have been released by this star at this moment. He likened Blackout to Twin Peaks, stating both were innovative and intriguing pieces of art based around the cliché good girl gone bad trope. Ewing said Blackout sounded threatening at some points and defying at others, and it was a more creative response to the media scrutiny than making heartfelt apologetic ballads about it. He also pointed out how the honest tune on the album wasn't used just to correct Britney's vocals, but for dramatic effect and to create moments in her songs that are distorted and disorienting. Coincidentally, most of the negative reviews hated the auto-tune on Blackout. The Guardian pointed out that Britney had two options for her album, especially with her reputation in tatters. She could have attempted to return to the bubblegum innocent sounding music people knew her for and hoped the nostalgia would repair her image, or she could take a risk and update her sound and make an album it sounds like she'd make in her current state. According to them, choosing the latter was a success and produced a record that innovated pop with its futuristic sound. They claimed on Blackout, Britney was unleashing a torrent of ferociously distorted synthesizers, electronically treated vocals, snapping drum samples, and bobber booted glam rock beats. The results are largely fantastic. Several publications slammed Blackout, for example, Enemy, who rated it a 4 out of 10. Other than the vocals, several negative reviews said Britney singing about clubbing and being high wasn't a good look based on her track record and considering she currently only had supervised visitation with her sons. Slant Magazine criticized the direction Britney took with the album compared to the leaked demos. They stated, The demos don't just humanize Britney, they make a case for what vocal ability and songwriting skills she actually possesses and her decision to leave them in the recycle bin in favor of songs that underscore her caricatured, gum-snapping, helium voice stripper routine is a dubious one. It's a side of Britney we've yet to really hear, and one that, for whatever reason, she feels compelled to keep hidden beneath a bad weave. A fan forum called Pop Justice still contains several posts about Blackout from 2007, and going through them, the reviews are overwhelmingly positive. Most of the negative comments are about the choice in singles or the album's cover, which several critics also disliked. Fans noted that compared to the photos that came with Blackout's booklet, the photo used for the cover was the worst. Piece of Me was Blackout's second single and was released about a month after the album. Piece of Me is Britney's most direct response to all the media scrutiny. The title works on two levels. You Want a Piece of Me are fighting words, of course, but can also be interpreted as a reference to Britney being made into a product for consumption, good or bad. Britney reminds listeners she's been under a microscope since age 17 and arguably before, and all her actions have been compared to her constructed image as America's sweetheart. In terms of the paparazzi and the media, she's damned if she does and damned if she doesn't. But despite how much the public loves to criticize Britney, they were watching her every move and enjoying it. Though Britney's personal life was in shambles, her music was still doing well and she had accomplished feats a lot of artists could only dream of. Britney also took a hit at those who criticized her parenting or being a parent at all by saying, Guess I can't see no harm in working and being a mama and with a kid on my arm, I'm still an exceptional earner. Like Gimme More, Piece of Me topped the Billboard Hot Dance Club play charts. Though it only peaked at number 18 in the Hot 100, it received similar claims to Gimme More. Fun fact, Robin actually sings some of the background vocals on Piece of Me. The music video for Piece of Me was also well received and was a dramatized version of Britney's experiences with the paparazzi over the past years. The video won Britney her first VMAs. She won for Video of the Year, Best Female Video, and Best Pop Video. Blackout's third single, Break the Ice, was released in March of 2008. It was chosen instead of Radar. Break the Ice peaked at number 43 in the Hot 100, but went number one in the Dance Club Songs chart. Reviews were favorable, but several stated it shouldn't have been the next single, with Radar, Toy Soldier, or Get Naked being stronger choices. It would have been interesting to see how Toy Soldier would have performed as a single, because it seems like one of those songs people would either really love or really hate. Some in the Pop Justice Forum were of the opinion that Toy Soldier was a song only Britney could do and would have been terrible on any other artist. Get Naked, on the other hand, was more universally liked. Fans enjoyed the sinful and suggestive nature of the song and how catchy it was. If it's not obvious yet, Blackout's B-sides were considered as strong as the singles. Tracks like Perfect Lover and Hot as Ice could just as easily have been made singles and likely performed well. 
Hot as Ice is a personal favorite, and it's always baffling to me that this is another one of Danger's beats because it's very reminiscent of the Neptunes. This just speaks to the brilliance of the roster of the producers chosen for Blackout and how well their sounds work together. Britney recorded Hot as Ice with T-Pain, who has a writing credit on the song. It was originally called Cold as Fire, but changed after the leak. In an interview, T-Pain implied Hot as Ice was intended to be Blackout's lead single, or had at least been considered. Why Should I Be Sad is the only song the Neptunes produced on Blackout. It has that dreamy, bouncy production typical of a Neptune song. In Why Should I Be Sad, Britney sings about her divorce from Kevin and her residual feelings after the relationship ended, despite all the conflicts that ensued while they were together. She sings about doing a lot for Kevin and giving him an expensive lifestyle and seeing nothing for it. She also says her kids will be just fine, so the magazines need to stop writing about them. Britney didn't do much promotion for Blackout. Despite its acclaim, she was still the subject of heavy media scrutiny and stories about her behavior were still being published frequently. After the performance at the VMAs, it was better not to hurt the album's momentum with any more bad performances. In addition, Britney had already started working on her next album, Circus, which took up some of her time. It was also clear that during this time, Britney was still very much struggling, so her focus wasn't likely on album promotions either. Around the time of Blackout's release, Britney met a man named Sam Lutfi. She claimed they were friends, but soon after meeting, he had moved into Britney's home and was controlling her finances and acting as her quasi-manager. There was speculation that Britney and Lutfi were dating, but Britney started dating paparazzo Adam Galib a couple months after meeting Lutfi. Those close to Britney didn't approve of her relationships with Lutfi or Galib, claiming both men were taking advantage of her. There were rumors Galib attempted to shop around a sex tape of Britney's. He, on the other hand, claimed they had a simple relationship, but he was worried she'd die from her drug use. The relationship only lasted a year, and Britney eventually filed a restraining order against Galib in 2009. In December of 2007, Britney celebrated her 26th birthday. Court documents revealed just a couple days later that welfare investigators were looking into allegations of child abuse and neglect. The claims are made in the middle of the ongoing custody battle. Days into the new year, Britney was taken to the hospital after a nearly four-hour standoff with Kevin in which she refused to hand over her sons despite their custody arrangement. Police attempted to mediate, but the situation resulted in Britney being taken to Cedar sinai for an evaluation. Paparazzi swarmed Britney's home, taking photographs and videos as she was put into the ambulance. The following day, Kevin was granted sole legal and physical custody of their sons, and Britney's visitation was suspended. She went to the hospital once more at the end of January and was placed on a mental evaluation hold. It was revealed soon after that Britney was likely suffering from both bipolar disorder and postpartum depression. On February 1st of 2008, Britney and her estate were placed under a temporary conservatorship. Her father, James Spears, was named as her conservator along with attorney Andrew Wallet. The conservatorship was intended to manage Britney's estate and affairs while she was deemed unfit to do so herself. What was initially meant to be a temporary conservatorship was eventually extended indefinitely and lasted until November of 2021. Days after the conservatorship was put in place, a restraining order was filed against Sam Lutfi. Britney's mother, Lynn, reported the pair constantly fought and that Sam had cut Britney's home phone line and hit her phone chargers. Lynn brought up a recent argument in which Lutfi verbally abused Britney, calling her an unfit mother and claiming she was more worried about her boyfriend than her kids. According to Lynn, Lutfi was grinding up Britney's medication and putting it in her food. She claimed Lutfi said, If you try to get rid of me, she'll be dead and I'll piss on her grave. In April of 2008, it was announced Britney reunited with her former manager, Larry Rudolph, after firing him for urging her to go to rehab the previous year. Rudolph would resign from working for Britney in 2021. The blackout era didn't last long, pretty much ending by the spring of 2008. It was decided that Britney would start fresh with her next era circus and no more promotions would be focused on blackout. Radar was included as a bonus track on Britney's next album, Circus, which came out at the end of 2008 and was promoted as a single then. This was due to a contract with producers Bloodshine Avant stating that one of the songs they produced for Blackout had to be promoted as a single. There were rumors that at the very least, a tour would be announced to promote Blackout, but this never happened. However, Britney performed several songs from Blackout when she toured for Circus. For everything Britney went through during that era, Blackout still stands out as a gem in her discography. It's considered Britney's best album and one of the best pop albums of all time. Rolling Stone ranked it at number 441 on their 500 Best Albums of All Time list. Blackout has been credited with ushering in the electropop, dance pop, and avant disco sounds that characterize a lot of early to mid-2010s pop. Its impact was so strong that some have nicknamed it the Bible of Pop. In 2012, Blackout was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 
Several articles celebrating Blackout's 10-year anniversary highlighted how well the album aged and what a feat it was for Britney. In their retrospective, Vice stated, But while members of the press hounded her, Britney was channeling her negative energy into what was arguably 21st century pop culture's most remarkable reclaiming of identity. It came in the form of a new and now highly influential record, one that would help Britney focus on something and take command while her ability to control the perception of her personal life was slipping through her hands. Blackout influenced several pop stars who came after Britney, Charlie XCX being one. Charlie told The Fader in 2017, The sound of this record was so fresh to me, she went with some really interesting producers on that record, and the combination of all of it was pretty next level. I remember thinking that the songs felt very ahead of their time. They could still be on the radio now. Blackout influenced the darker, more experimental pop sound of Charlie and peers like Kim Petras and Slater. Both have named Britney as inspiration, and Kim said listening to Britney's music helped her learn English. Slater says she doesn't mind when people say her music sounds like bad Britney music because at least she's being mentioned in the same sentence as her idol. The fact that a lot of the current pop girls make reference to Britney Spears and use the 2000s tabloid era as a point of reference for their sound and aesthetic has only further cemented Blackout's relevance. Outside of music, Britney's Blackout era is almost always referenced in conversations about the negative impacts of fame and how terribly celebrities, especially young women, were treated in the media in the 2000s. At the end of the day, throughout the whole era, the world was watching a woman in her 20s in the midst of a mental health crisis. Several people delighted in Britney's downward spiral, and if anything, it's proof that a lot of people who support a star's rise to success will be just as entertained by their downfall. The blackout era was a reminder that oftentimes, spectators aren't necessarily supporters. I know a lot went on in the blackout era, and I know a lot of people are protective of Britney, but I do hope that I did this era justice. And now that I'm almost the age that Britney was during the blackout era, I think I was able to look back on it with a lot more sympathy than I was able to have the first time this was happening purely because I was a child at the time. And I think with this whole story, it's sort of easy to brush it off on the paparazzi and the tabloids and say, oh, you know what, they were the problem. And they were, but they weren't 100% of the problem. And now that things like social media exist, a lot of us are able to sort of propagate that same sort of hate and that same sort of attack and spew vitriol out to celebrities and to the general public, and we don't have to wait for a tabloid to do it. But yes, that is my retrospective on the Blackout era. Definitely let me know your thoughts on this album. Definitely, definitely let me know your favorite songs and just how you feel about the album and the era in general. I have noticed lately that with the albums that I choose for the Eras Analyzed and a lot of the albums that you guys ask me to go over in the Eras Analyzed, a lot of them are albums that are older or a few years old. And I'm not sure if that's just because it's easier to do a sort of retrospective of an entire album and an era once we're a few years removed from the album, or if that makes it easier to contextualize it in the artist's discography. But that is something that I've noticed. Not saying it's a problem, but you know what? Either way, let me know what other albums you would love for me to cover for Eras Analyzed. As always, thank you all so, so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so that you can stick around for more. Also, make sure to follow me on Twitter so that you can keep up with me there. And if you'd like to become a channel member, you can click the link in the description of this video. I'll see you dolls very soon. Love you. Bye-bye.